Before we get to Sally and our first science question, let's talk about the science of time. Movement watches were started by two broke college kids that wanted to wear stylish watches but couldn't afford them, so they started their own watch company. Movement watches have a classic design, quality construction, minimalist style. They have over 500,000 watches sold in 160 countries. You get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to mvmtwatches.com slash clarify. Uh, this watch has really clean design. Uh, I get tons of compliments on it. And now's the time to step up your watch game. Go to mvmtwatches.com slash clarify. You can get a snazzy watch just like this one I got on right here. Do it. You want to be like me, right? I'm a role model or something. And now science. Hey everyone, welcome to the fourth ever episode of Let Me Clarify, the show that will not stop. It just keeps going. We've done a whole four episodes. Uh, that's that's like a whole tele that's like a whole season of television in the UK, isn't it, Sally? That is more than a season of Sherlock. <laughs> so uh, we're 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 running at a breakneck speed. We're going to pass Sherlock here very soon. I hope. Same quality as well. I mean, the budget is exactly the same for <laughs> Sherlock and for this. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's dive right into the questions. Thinking about human relationships, uh, you know, people will get together and break up or, you know, people will get married and potentially divorced. Is there, you know, an animal equivalent to like, like I know some animals will be monogamous lifetime, but is there an equivalent for those animals of like a, of a divorce? Is there any evidence of them, you know, deciding they, they can't work it out and going their separate ways? Yeah, to some extent. Um, I've actually got a friend who studies divorce in birds. Really? Um, <laughs> There's a, it's a study. Yeah. She's currently looking at all the different bird species and kind of patterns of divorce in, in birds. Yeah. So I, I don't know the answer yet because I'm not sure we do know the answer yet, but it certainly happens. Um, some individuals just genetically aren't well suited to each other and they're genetically incompatible and can't have fertile kids. And so in that case, it would be very advantageous to split up. Most of the times when you have divorce, it's not so much divorce as widowing. Um, so in these, I'm thinking of monogamous seabirds just because they're the most well known. So you've got like your penguins and your albatrosses, which pair for life. Um, if one of them dies, then often the other one will go on to find another mate. Um, sometimes it's the same sex mate, which is really cute. There's a story where, um, there was one, I'm going to say albatross, although I'm not entirely certain of the species, um, where she lost her husband, essentially, to use really human language. And um, there was another female around who also wasn't partnered up for that breeding season. But the, the female had already laid her egg and it's impossible to rear a chick on your own. And so she's like, oh, well, do you want to help me raise this chick? And they did, and they raised it together in a nice, happy family, except everything's not a happy family because it's nature and I'm completely anthropomorphizing. Um, but you get the idea. Um, the trouble is, is that in most animal species, monogamy is the exception rather than the rule. Monogamy is really, really rare in nature. And, um, polygamy or polygyny, multiple females, polyandry, multiple males is a much more common system. And so you'll have what's called extra pair copulations, which is just one individual sleeping around. And that happens a lot, like so much. There's a story of the Dunnock, which is a little house sparrow. Oh, it's not a house sparrow, it's a hedge sparrow. And the Victorians, held it up as the like the best example of Victorian ideals because it's drab, it's brown, and they thought, ah, oh, everyone should be like the Dunnock because it's it's kind of it's grey and it's it's very sexually repressed like the Victorians were. Turns out the vast majority of eggs in of, of nests with eggs in have more than two fathers siring the eggs. Like we can now look at the genetics and do paternity tests on the chicks in the nest and find out that the vast majority of females deliberately seek out extra mates um, and still have one male looking after fathering the chicks and doing all the hard work. So that's, a, that's an interesting idea I never thought about. The different eggs in a nest can be fathered by different males? Yeah. So there's cuckolding from cuckoos, but it, cuckolding happens in species other than the cuckoo. It, yeah, it, yeah, it happens all the time. So much so, I think it's the splendid fairy wren or the blue fairy wren. One of the fairy wrens, this beautiful, tiny little bird, 
has 95% extra pair um, copulations, extra pair mating, which means that if you were to take an egg, so say there were 100 eggs, 95% of them would not be fathered by the father of the nest. So you've still got one female and one male per nest, and those are the ones bringing the food back to the chicks. They're the ones kind of cleaning out the nest, making sure that there's enough bedding, but it, he's not only fathering his own kids. He's, most of his eggs in that basket are not his, but he probably has eggs in some other, some yeah. other nest, so it all works out in the end. They would have the best episodes of Jerry Springer if they had television, I think. Oh, I, I, I mean, my life is being Jerry Springer for flies. <laughs> like, that's what I do for a living. The government pays me to, to have like all these weird families and then have them mating within families or, oh, you shagged my sister. No, hang on, you shagged him and then you shagged his brother. Oh, what are you gonna do next? And it's all that kind of thing. It's, yeah, that's what I do for a living. Do you print up little note cards that say you are not the father or you are the father and show them to the camera? <laughs> I don't, but I do do paternity testing on my flies. <laughs> okay, good, good to know. I'm never going to look at you the same way again, Sally. <laughs> so I was thinking about appendages on mammals. And the way I was thinking about limbs. it was... What's that? Not just appendages. Limbs. For the internet, saying you're thinking about mammalian appendages. Limbs. Probably isn't the route you want to take. <laughs> so, okay, limbs, correct. Um, and I was thinking about how humans have two arms and two legs. And I was thinking about my dogs and how they have four legs. And I started two thinking... Two arms, two legs, actually. Okay, two arms, two legs. So I started wondering, why don't we see mammals with anything other than four limbs? Why, why, is there a reason for that? Or, or, or are there mammals that do have more than four limbs? So firstly, your dog has arms and legs, not just four legs. The bones in your arms are different to the bones in your leg. And the bones in the dog are equivalent to our arm bones. And the bones in the back legs are equivalent to our leg bones. Um, so dogs do have elbows. Um, not just four knees. Um, so the reason that all mammals have four limbs, it's kind of a boring answer, but it's just because we evolved from a four-limbed animal. Oh. So way back, um, about 400 million years ago, when there was no real vertebrate life on land, so nothing with a bone was on land, um, there were some fish swimming in the sea, and one of these fish thought, hmm, I want to paddle around in that shallow muddy bit over there. And so it grew, it grew, it evolved. This one individual didn't just go, hey, I want some <laughs> arms and grew some arms. Over time and Darwinian evolution, um, these fish got arms, we call them lobed finned fishes, so they could kind of waddle through the mud. And they also started to evolve lungs so that if say the tide went out, they could still breathe and wait until the tide came back in. So they evolved four legs and lungs before they moved onto land. So we can see the Tiktaalik um, fossil, um, which is a really cool, it's kind of half fish and then half um, land living animal, which we call tetrapod, because tetrapod, tetra meaning four, and pod, podes meaning limb, foot, um, it had four limbs. It had two front fins and two back fins. And then every single other tetrapods since then, so that's the reptiles, the birds, the amphibians, and the mammals, all evolved from that same lineage of fish that went onto land. And because that fish had four legs, or four limbs, everything since then is based on four limbs. So I mean, we've got things like snakes, where they still have kind of tiny, tiny, tiny little leg and arm bones, but they've been sucked in, and legless lizards as well. And I suppose you could argue that things like an elephant trunk or a monkey's prehensile tail also count as limbs in that sense. So they are appendages that are prehensile and can grab things. Um, but yeah, they're not quite the same leg structure that you're thinking of. Right, like no locomotion possible really with a tail. I guess they, well, can, they can swing they, around. They use tails, yeah, for... Um, Brachiation, I think it's called, where so gibbons, um, so gibbons don't have these long tails, but they'll do this, and other monkeys with the long tails will do a similar thing, where you've got a very long tail gripping onto one branch, and then with their arm they're able to reach out into the next one. I want a tail now.
I want a tail so bad. You want a tail? Yeah, I want a tail. I want to do that. I, I, th- I feel like we, we would rethink public transportation or even sidewalks. You know, we could have we mul- multi-level. Yeah, but we'd also have to rethink trousers. Yeah, well, that's and easy. And chairs as well. Where do you tuck your tail when you want to sit down? We just need all those chairs that don't have the back all the way down, you know, like uh, the cheap ones you get at Ikea. Then mm-hmm. that, that would solve it. Although, and trousers, you need a pair of scissors. I could fix my trousers right now. I, I, would, I would buy a pair of scissors if I could have a tail. Really? Would sure. it have to be a prehensile tail? Yes, it has to be prehensile. I don't want some okay. dumb tail just sticking out back there. And are we going to go for furry, like a ringtail lemur type thing, or squirrel? Or are we going to go more like a rat's tail? I think more furry, kind of like, like the lemur. Uh, I think squirrel tail, for me, is a little too flashy. And a rat's okay. tail just is a little too gross. I need to have some fur on there to, uh, okay. to make it look cute. And is it going to be striped colored? What are we going? Oh, is it is a signaling tail? You're going to waft pheromones <laughs> with it? Why, why do you want a tail? I think it would be cool. I think I'd grab onto stuff. Like I could be typing on my computer and my tail could bring a drink to me and I could drink while I, I can still be typing the whole time. Mm-hmm. That, would, that is possible. Yeah. See, I think, uh, I think we, we, we need to get on that. If you, if you know anybody over there that you work with. Uh, well, I mean, I mentioned on the last Rooster Teeth podcast that there are people born with tails, although they're not prehensile. Um, but yeah, tails are still in our genome. Just The genes are just asleep at the moment. Mm. So genetically, we could possibly engineer humans with tails. I mean, we won't because ethics. But <laughs> if we do, oh, these boring ethics. Oh my God, they stop us just researching on humans. Um, but if we could, I, I mean, it's possible. There are people that are waking up the sleeping genes in chickens in order to give chickens claws like dinosaurs and teeth like dinosaurs. Um, that sounds terrifying. S- that sounds like yeah, the beginning they- of a science fiction movie where everything goes wrong. Well, the guy that's doing it was the inspiration behind Sam Neill's character in Jurassic Park. Okay. So he's like the dinosaur guy. And, uh, yeah, they're trying to make a chickenosaurus in what, or a dino chicken. One year in the future, we're going to all be living underground in terror, in terror, running away from chickens with teeth who have taken over the earth. And we're going to remember this day. They're all in Montana. So just come to Europe and it'll be fine. <laughs> that's, that's true. I guess they can't get over the water. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Sally. I think uh, I, I learned a little bit today. Hopefully our audience did, too. And uh, so uh, I'm glad you learned something. Yeah, and I, I learned I want a tail. I never knew it before. Uh, so uh, thanks for watching, and we will see you guys next week. <laughs>